Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by Chris Collins, my colleague at Garden Organic. Every month we bring you tips and advice on how to grow the organic way. This month is all about feeling good. We've had a difficult start to the year, what with one thing and another, and the weather can be tough with no real signs of the warmth of spring to cheer the heart. So Chris and I thought we'd share with you those little jobs which make you feel good. Some are outside when you feel the need for fresh air, and some are indoors when all you want to do is keep warm. They'll help you prepare for the busy growing season ahead and give you that inner smile of satisfaction from jobs ticked off a list. Oh, and talking of smiles, our guest this month always seems to be beaming. Danny Clark is the son of Jamaican parents, and he brings that Caribbean sunshine with him. You may know Danny from the popular television series, The Instant Gardener. He and Chris chat about the passion of growing, and between them they bring a warmth to a cold February day. And we finish with our usual bulging post bag. This month we discuss sourcing the best soil for raised beds, whether you can grow potatoes from the store cupboard, and should you be worried if your apple tree has bright orange patches on it. But first, a quick reminder that this podcast is supported by our brilliant sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. Whether you're looking for information, ready to take your first step into organic gardening, or planning your next plot, organiccatalogue.com is the right place for you. They're proud to offer a complete range of organic gardening products, from seeds and plants to equipment. And as they say, it's never too late to grow the organic way. This month, they suggest why not try something like Super Soil to really get those bumper crops. Shop online at organiccatalogue.com. And if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. So now I'm off to join Chris once more down the line in our virtual potting shed. Hey, Chris, what weather we've been having. I'm looking out onto cold snow, but the forecast is for rain and then more rain and then more rain. Yeah, it is the dark month, Sarah. It really is. Everybody's kind of bring on the spring. I think that's particularly poignant, obviously, this year through due to our lockdown situation. Yeah, spring can't come soon enough, Sarah. I couldn't agree with you more, but I always think that February and, and March actually divides the nation in terms of weather, doesn't it? So down south, we're relatively lucky. I know we've got snow at the moment, but it'll pass and it'll it'll become more mild but up north i guess you're stuck with snow for some time well it's interesting i um, put some leaf mold on my balcony i've got all my bulbs are coming through and i always worry about them rotting or whatever so i give them a little bit of texture i bring some leaf mold i've got from the allotment and I just do a little thin top dress on each pot and i put this out on social media and all my scottish mates went well you're way ahead of us no sign of our bulbs yet. And it's just a kind of a little reminder that the disparity between what we get down south and what they get up north and the difference in growth rates is always worth a consideration when we're talking about gardening. It's you balmy Londoners, and that's balmy with an L, <laughs> not an R, Chris. <laughs> true, true. OK, so we know February is a difficult month for all sorts of reasons, and I'm going to give you three reasons to be cheerful. One, Very good. OK, one, the days are getting longer, no doubt about it. Two, I've got aconites flowering. Do you know those brilliant yellow, sweet little flowers? They come shooting up through the snow against that dark brown, muddy soil. I love them. And daffodil buds are already forming. And three, tomorrow it's candle mass. Now that's my favourite celebration when we light a candle against the dark times. Oh, that sounds wonderful. What a lovely idea. And I think they are definitely worth cheering about because it's that kind of the time for renewal is coming closer, isn't it? And it's very, very hard not to get excited, Sarah. You can feel it. You can see it as well. You can see shoots coming up. You can see buds forming. But don't hurry. Just don't hurry. Take your time in February. You've still got a month to prepare and to think about what you're going to do rather than rushing into doing it because you'll get caught out by the weather. But I thought it would be nice, Chris, to draw up a nice little to do list, one that's easy and satisfying to tick off. And it kind of gets you in in that prime position for when spring does actually start and the growing gets busy. Certainly. I think it's quite a nice time to to venture out and have a little potter, have that to do list, go out, look at what you might want to get into as the weather changes. Just get yourself in that frame of mind because we have been hunkered down, haven't we, Sarah? That's very true. And let's start with your allotment. What are you what are you going to be doing this month? Well, as we're in February, I'm still um, taking advantage of the quiet times to reconstruct. I've been replacing all my raised beds. I don't have high raised beds. It's just I have planks and I've, they've become rotten over time. So I'm replacing all of those, which is a nice 
warm job for you on the cold days. And I'm also, I have a lot of problems with my pathways, which were initially grass, but because I have such a, a heavy problem with horsetail, very well documented and other um, weeds, I want to try and reduce my maintenance. So I'm actually making my paths from my pex, which is like a membrane, porous membrane. And I can put that down and that will smother the weeds and that will make my life a little bit easier. So there's quite a lot of construction going on. I am sowing a little bit of seed and I am planting a little bit of bulb. I've got my shallot bulbs in, so I, I like to start them in pots. They're in my polytunnel. And I'm also sowing my broad beans into, into root trainers because I think that gives them a really good, strong start. Now, I have been through the catalogues. I have got my seed list. I, as well as everybody else, really want to get going on sowing. And I, you know, you really have to bite the bullet a bit here, resist it. I mean, I, a few years ago, I went a bit too early and you get very leggy plants because the light levels. Even a professional gardener meat like me who's been doing it a long time, you have to just hang on, hang on. It's not quite time just yet. I think most importantly is the soil hasn't warmed up yet. And until that happens, and you will know literally by holding the soil in your hand as to whether it's got warm enough to start working into it. Nature will tell you when, when, when it's ready, but it certainly isn't this month. No, it's very, very too early. So just something to look forward to. Don't jump the gun, I would say. One little trick I tend to do as well as I tend to fleece a couple of my raised beds. I'll put some fleece down, pin that in with 10 pegs, just because I'm trying to preempt that warming of that soil and I can start put my quick crops in my rockets and my salads in, in, in March. So I'm kind of, uh, I'm just trying to jump the gun a little bit in that, in that sense, when it comes to soil warmth. I've been in my little greenhouse just recently. And as you know, I washed, washed it down last month because it was getting quite green and algae and, and the light wasn't getting through the glass. So I washed that down and now I'm throwing out all the remains of any old potting compost. I know it's tempting to keep it, but in truth, it could be harboring pests or diseases. So empty out all your pots that have got dead plants in them, anything that's got any leftover potting mix in it. Best to put it on the compost heap or use it maybe later on as a top dressing on the lawn. I then be going outside and checking my new black currant fruit bushes, which I put in last autumn. And I want to make sure they're still firmed in because we've had some heavy frosts. And what the frost does is it expands the water in the soil and it pushes the small plant up. So make sure that that plant, that anything that you've newly planted in the autumn is nicely firmed in. I'm super excited by my daffodils and other bulbs okay. which are pushing up. So I'm taking time to, to appreciate them. And I'm totally, Chris, I'm totally in love with my faithful hellebores. These flower every February and the pureness and the beauty of those flowers after the barrenness of winter, those flowers are wonderfully large and beautiful. I feel really they should be there on a June day, not a February day. Yeah, I really appreciate hellebore. They come along to the rescue when uh, everything else is sleeping don't they and you know what they're tough plants you can put them in borders you can plant them under trees they really are they do the job there's very little fuss with them and i think they um they're a light in the tunnel aren't they this time of year wouldn't you agree it's actually too soon to be spreading compost on the soil wait for another month when the worst of the winter rains are over but you can as always get out inspect your compost heap if it's an open heap take care not to disturb any creatures that might be hibernating in there but give it a little a, a little turnover to aerate it if you have a plastic Dalek, I call it, you know, the plastic compost bins, it's actually fine to just tip that up, get everything out, rake it over and shove it all back in again. You'll get that air mixed into the, the decaying matter and that will speed up the decay. Yeah, it's a good time to be doing it. And that's remember, that's our gardener's gold, I like to call the compost, and you'll be looking forward to using that. I was going to say about not disturbing, I've got an open composter and I was in with my hands. I like to get in with my hands. It's lovely and mucky, lovely and dirty. I quite enjoy it, but it's a way of not disturbing the wildlife if should any be kipping in there. And I've been doing a little bit of pruning as well. It's cold. My God, my hands get cold. But it's a lovely winter thing to do. And I've been pruning my small willow tree. I've cut it right back. And I've kept the sticks as there'll be good little stakes for supporting young plants later in the year. And also I've been pruning my climbers, roses and honeysuckle and jasmine. You can cut them down really quite hard, even when it's this cold. They'll survive and they'll shoot again later in the spring. Yeah, it's a good uh time of year for pruning actually going along with you, you touched on it a minute ago making sure you, you do your 3ds your dead dying damaged materials getting cutting that out making sure that you, your plants are hygienic the air's uh, moving through them but also apples are coming up pruning apples at the end of the month 
like you say, your climbers. I'll be looking at my roses as well, any climbing roses, taking out the thin in the wood and get them down to some nice strong stems. It's a good time to be looking at plants because they're not cloaked in leaves. You can see the frameworks of them and you can prune. And it's a very methodical, very meditative thing to do, isn't it? It is. I, I well, love it. On. That's the only thing. Make sure you've got them thermals on. <laughs> and for me, warm gloves as well. Yeah. But it's interesting you mention apple trees because I know we've got a question on that later in, in the post yeah. bag. Okay, so let's face it, the weather isn't great. And are there some indoor jobs we could be doing, Chris? Well, there's a couple. I came up with a with an idea because um, I always like to keep busy when it comes to gardening, especially when I, even when I'm at home. And uh, I came up with the idea of a tea tray allotment. Oh, which, uh, tell me yes. more. <laughs> I quite like this. We've all got uh, like a tea tray hanging around the house, haven't we? Remember the things you get in the canteen when you're at school and you put your dinner on and you went to pay for it? I've got a couple of those. And I've saved up some containers that you get mushrooms or tomatoes in in the supermarket. So these plastic containers... And they're already aerated. They've already got holes in the bottom. So they're going to be my raised bed. So I've got my tea tree, tree tray for my plot, my plastic containers, which you can wash out and use again, by the way, as my raised beds. And you in those, put them I'm on top of the tray? Sorry. Yes, so I'll sit them in the tray. So if you can imagine, you've got the tray and then my, my uh, containers are dotted in the tray, OK? So they're like raised miniature raised beds in a miniature allotment. And then in those, I'm going to sow, I'm going to do pea shoots. I'm going to do... Cut and come again lettuce, I might do some rocket, some mustard maybe, some, or any micro crops. I've got some micro seeds, like radish seeds are really nice. I'll, I'll, I'll get some nice good um, peat-free seed compost, sow all those in there, and then so that they'll grow up and I can just nip away at them in my scissors for my sandwiches or my salads. And then just to add it off, just to finish it, give it a nice touch, I will probably put cotton wool all through the, the gaps between the containers and sow cress into that, because cress will grow into that, no problem. So it's almost like having grass paths around your containers. I might even make a miniature scarecrow, Sarah. Oh, I love it, Chris, and not a sign of horsetail. Not a sign of horsetail, yeah. It's, it's, it's right. My nemesis will be nowhere near it. <laughs> it sounds such a lovely thing to do, especially with kids. Kids would love setting that up. And presumably you leave it in a nice sunny window. Yeah, I'll put it in the windowsill and I will water it mainly with a sprayer, a water sprayer. Every day I'll give it a pump action. I've got those little pump action water sprayers. I'll soak it down with that. That way I won't flood it or overwater it. And they take quite, come up quite quickly and you've got your own salad buffet in your windowsill. Tea tray allotment. I love it, Chris. Yeah. You heard it here first. Um, what about your house plants? Are you looking at them? Yes, I am. I mean, this is usually the time of year I'll be looking to pot stuff on. I've got, I've got this lovely big ficus benjamin, a weeping fig in the front room. And uh, it's about a foot short of the ceiling now. And I'm determined to get it right to the top this year. Mm -hmm. the window. It's a beautiful plant. But the main thing I'll be doing is I'll be dividing. I've got things like calathias spathophyllums which are clump forming forest floor plants and they tend to kind of get when they get pot bound they tend to get a bit sad the center of them tend to die out so i'll be knocking them out gently teasing them all apart well not even gently i'll pull them apart they're quite tough and then i'll pot them up in a peat free potting compost and then i've got probably five plants instead of one so i can give some away as gifts as well but it reinvigorates the plant you get this fresh growth it gives it impetus it like stimulates them that's the word i'm looking for I love also the, the idea that you're going to be giving the, the little plantlets away because one of the issues with growing houseplants is actually sourcing organic ones. It's, it's virtually impossible. And so by sharing these, these little plantlets, you're, you're pursuing the organic line because we know they've been grown organically. Yeah, well, it's really difficult. I mean, if you go into most places that sell houseplants, they're going to be grown in peat. They just are. Oh, that's a fact of life. So we're, we're, by propagating ourselves, we can get around that. And I just think, you know, if someone gives you a plant, it's going to give you a smile on your face, isn't it? It does. Are you sowing indoors, Chris, for outdoor veg? In other words, are you trying to get ahead with your sowing for your veg patch? I, I'm holding back at the moment because I just think it's a little bit early, Sarah, and I'm dying to start sowing. But I think I've been caught out in the past where I have kind of sown a bit early and, that, and I'll get quite leggy seedlings and I go run into trouble. So I am holding back. The only thing, as I said earlier, is I'll probably do my broad beans into some root trainers and I'm going to try and hold on till I get going next month. Root trainer sounds quite technical. I use toilet rolls. Yep, just as good, just as good. The thing about root trainers, though, is they're like ribbed seed trays. So you get a, a, like a cell, like when you put your seed in, and they're ribbed and it just pushes the roots down so you get the quite deep rooting seeding for when you plant out. 
And obviously, legumes particularly don't like their feet messed with too much. So the root trainer gets you around that. OK, that's a good tip. I'm sorry, Chris, I, 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 I've I, been a tiny bit distracted while you were talking because I'm recording this just sitting in front of the French windows and outside the snow is still quite thick on the ground and, and against it are silhouetted the old dead plants from my, my flowery border. So there's calendula, there's snapdragons or whatever. And four goldfinches came down and oh, pecked away at the seeds. Did you know it's called a charm of goldfinches? I did not. What an amazing name for them, really. Isn't it that's, lovely? And that's actually very apt because they are the most stunning little birds, aren't they? I had a flock of them a, a month or so ago. They came and went, but there were a lot of them and they're so beautiful aren't they they really are a charm is a very apt name for them but it doesn't it completely reinforce the whole principle of don't be too but tidy in your garden don't cut down all that dead growth at the beginning of winter leave it there because it's so important for the bird to access it for food exactly also there's doing a few things if it's a herbaceous perennial you're protecting the roots, those new shoots, as they start to come through towards the end of the month and early next month. Protect them from any cold frost or damp. So it does a, actually serves a purpose. Your hardy annuals like calendula, they'll free seed. You know, as Gertrude Jekyll said, let them come, let them free. They're all welcome in my garden. So you can let things pop up here and there. And you get that natural, diverse garden, which I so love. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it just ties in with the whole organic principle of just working with nature. Of course we don't use toxic chemicals that that that's a given but it's it goes further than that it's being guided by those natural cycles and and, and events i find it very exciting and very creative well you get your rewards don't you like you know when you get goldfinches coming in a charm visiting you you know what more can you ask for it just really is nothing but delight thank you chris you're absolutely right and now it's time to meet our guest Chris met Danny Clark in London way back in November, long before lockdown. Danny is known to many as the presenter on the TV programme, The Instant Gardener. He and Chris share a lovely positivity on the benefits of gardening, and they discuss ideas on how to bring diversity into the gardening world. So I'm here with Danny Clark, which is the first time we've met, isn't it, Danny? It is the first time we've met, but I've met you on the telly many moons ago, Chris. <laughs> I've met you on the telly too. Oh, yeah, you yeah, may yeah. have done, but I yeah. think you influenced me more than I influenced you, because there's little phrases that you use that I bring into my presenting. Oh, very, I could yeah. be more complimented. Oh, I, yeah. well, well, <laughs> you know, you, you're very good and very impressive. And one of the phrases you use is um, getting up close and personal yeah, with like, your yeah. plants. Be, I used to love that when you said it. <laughs> I love that. You know, I'm into the tactile side oh, of plants. Oh, yeah. you just showed so much passion. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, passion is contagious, isn't it? If well, you're enthusiastic so. about something, it, it rubs off. Yeah, it comes over with you as well. We were there for a reason, aren't we? We do yeah. what we do for a reason. It's not We're not just going for the motions, are we? We love what we do. Yeah, That's exactly. the thing. I mean, do you know what? I couldn't think of doing anything else but this. Me neither. I've um, never, never wanted to. Yeah. I mean, have you always done it? Always done it, yeah. Oh, see, I feel I've missed out on a few years because yeah. it came to me later in life. Right, OK. Um, it was a career change yeah. by accident. I was, um, basically, I was in sales and... Things weren't going too well. This was in the early 90s. And I just got this random phone call from this lady, Jo Bryan, who's looking for a gardener. And she had heard that I enjoyed gardening. But doing, I wasn't a professional or anything like that. Sure. I didn't really know a plant from a weed. But I just enjoyed being outside in my own plot. And she asked if I'd come and work for her uh, one day a week. I mean, her place was amazing. I mean, her house was falling down. But she had the most amazing garden. Uh -huh. It covered about two acres of woodland and pristine garden. She had one of these all year round tans because she was always in it. Yeah, brilliant. But she got to a point where she couldn't handle it anymore for health reasons. Huh? She was one of these people. I mean, we were talking about, you know, enthusiasm being contagious. She was the same. Whenever she greeted me, it'd be, Danny, how wonderful to see you. And sometimes, if it was pouring down the rain or whatever and cold, and she could tell by my expression I didn't fancy working that day, <laughs> I just wanted to say, Danny, don't worry about today. Go away. Uh. We'll come back when the sun comes out. She wouldn't do that. She'd say something like, what a dramatic day. It, doesn't the sky look lovely? What a lovely grey colour. Yeah. Doesn't the wind feel wonderful on your face? <laughs> like, like this. <laughs> I'll be thinking, what planet are you on? But it would change my perception. Yeah. And I'd think, well, after all, there is a beauty in everything. 
if you choose to look for it. I think as a gardener, you do, you start to get very, I think you become very intimate with nature, don't you? Yeah. And, and so you take it all weathers, all climate, every, every little bit of it has its own beauty. It does. It's just, I think you need to kind of, you need to get a thick skin to begin with because you're, you're in, out in the wind you, and you, the rain. You, yeah. you are. And it's amazing when people say the sunshine, they say, what a lovely day. And when it isn't shining, they say it's a horrible day or it's a nasty day, but it isn't. Yeah. It's just a different kind of day. Exactly. That's all it is. Exactly. And, and we should so if you don't celebrate all the days, you could, you're going to narrow your scope, aren't you? You certainly are. You're just going to be waiting for the sun to come out. And in this country, it hardly ever does that. <laughs> It'd be a long way, wouldn't it? It'd be a long time. Yeah, yeah. Got, it, all, all, in all its glory, the different seasons, like we're coming into autumn yeah. now, I always find it's like an old friend turning up, isn't it? You've got to get is. very familiar yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, and we're, yeah. I should say we're in a beautiful spot here. I'm in Holland Park, aren't we? Uh, and in the Kyoto Garden, the Japanese Garden. Oh, it's beautiful. And it's in a beautiful autumn day, isn't it? It's stunning. And I, I was sitting there, I was wondering, obviously you do look quite a lot of design. What do you... What, what are your influences design? What do you like doing when you sit down with a pen and paper or you look at a garden? What do I like doing? Yeah. Well, basically, most of the gardens I do are sort of small urban gardens. Oh. And I tend to take my cue from the client, speak to them. If you listen to the client, it makes it easy. Because <laughs> yeah. they tell you what they want and you just interpret it. And that's really how I feel, that I'm an interpreter ah. of people's ideas. And I just make suggestions. So they'll say, well, this is what I want. I might want a patio. I want it to be this large. And I say, well, how about this? How about making it slightly smaller or slightly bigger or make it slanted or make it lower or put some plants in there so we can connect the patio with the garden, that kind of thing. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, that's all it is, really. Yeah. It's nothing... I don't think... For me, there's no magical... No, it's not. So you are, you're it's interpreting. Not, yeah, it's just interpretation. I, I, the hardest gardens to do is when people say to you, just get on with it. I know, because they, they yeah. have an idea what they want, but, they, but they're not telling you. <laughs> they're not that's telling you. Yeah, or yeah. maybe they don't have an idea. Yeah, yeah. And you have to try and draw, draw it, it out, out of them, them mm. you know? Mm. And they are the most difficult ones. Because really, most, when it comes to plots, they kind of design themselves. Yeah. And I tend to go with the flow of the land. Yeah. I try not to jar too much. So you like it to be, for want of a word, organic as possible? Oh, it's organic yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. And, and it must be their personality, not mine, yeah. not what I want. You're not it's there to, a, to force it on them? No, I wouldn't force it on no. them. I mean, I've got lots of weird and wonderful ideas in my <laughs> mind but I've never really been able to implement them because I think that would be unfair. Yes, I think you're right. Mm. I think it's their, guy. it's their space. You're going to go away at the end. I'm going to go away, yeah. So, but I suppose, you know, I'm, I suppose it's quite interesting that we live in more times where people are a bit more environmentally aware. Mm. Is that reflected in your clients? Are people yeah. worried about wildlife, say, diversity? They are, they are. And, and I'll tell you the other thing, that's, um, they're not into such a pristine look in their gardens, which is really what is, you know, that, that's definitely my cup of tea. I love gardens to look natural. Yeah. Because look, if you look around, you know, even here. Mm. I mean, I know this is a bit contrived where we are. You have got, this as you hit into the woodlands behind. You, and, yeah. yeah, so you've got this contrast here from what's going on around, mm. which is great. But with the woodlands, it's all natural. Yeah. And I think um, you can't beat nature. No, I don't think you can. I think when I started gardening, it was quite rigid. They were, were a lot mm. more gardeners, professional gardeners mm. for a start. But we were always edging things and weeding things. That We're much more freer with it now, aren't we? Much looser. Much and, and having birds and bees in the garden, yeah. is that important to you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we love to see birds and bees. And the thing is, you know... I, being a gardener, some of the things, you, you get um, incidents that happen that you just can't, well, you can't buy it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'll tell you a story when I was in the garden once and I was kneeling down weeding and um, I heard this crashing through the trees and I looked to my right and there was a sparrowhawk on the oh, ground brilliant. with a bird between his talons. And I tell you what, it could only have been about five metres away. It did not see me. And I just kept really motionless. The bird was still alive, by the way. Oh. The, the bird that was in between the towns of the Sparrowhawk. And it was looking around all regally like this, you know, proud of itself because it had caught something. And it did eventually fly off, but not because of me. It decided uh. it was time to so go. So just blended with that moment. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was brilliant. Very you know. special. You could have been another 10 years still in that spot and not see that. It again. wouldn't, it wouldn't <laughs> yeah, happen. Yeah. I know, you know, and I've spoken to, like, these bird experts, and they said I was really privileged to have seen that. And I really do. I mean, I remember it. It happened years and years <laughs> it's, ago. It's I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. And 
that's one of the beauties of what we do. Yeah, it certainly. gives you that supreme connection with. Uh, they say if you if you stay still enough for long enough in a place, nature will come to you. Yeah, and that was an example of that. Excellent, mm. excellent. So you do you're big also. One things we share, I think we both do quite a lot. We're both keen on community. You do stuff in schools and stuff. Don't yeah, well, you? I haven't done anything in schools yet, but that's my plan. Is your plan is it? So you've yeah. got a thing called Grow to Know. Can you tell me a little I'm bit about that? I'm a director that? of Grow to yeah, Know. Um, no, this this is amazing because I've connected with a guy called Tajan Hayden Smith who witnessed the fire, the Grenfell fire, mm. which most of us know about. Yep. He only lives a stone's throw away and he lost friends in it. And some people turned to art, some people turned to music for therapy. He turned to horticulture as a way of healing. Wow. And he hasn't got a garden, so he's got a balcony space, but he hasn't got a garden. And he would just go out and find a community space and just pick up syringes, pick up litter, cut back the grass, tidy it up. And by doing that, people would sort of come to him. You know, he would, he would attract people to him and he'd make friends. Some people offer their time and help him. Other people would only just chat for five minutes. But He's building up a community him, then, basically. Yeah, basically, what he's done, he started this um, charity called Olive Branch, which would facilitate him getting money to get tools to do up his spaces. So Grow to Know is kind of an offshoot of that. Right. So we've gone from that to Grow to Know. I mean, I was connected with him right at the start or when he had um, Olive Branch and we were like chatting and all the rest of it. But then he went off the radar because he plays a bit of football and he went abroad. And then when he came back, he got in touch with me. We met in Hammersmith and he said, I've got something to ask you, Dan. I said, well, what's that, Tasia? And he said, uh, I've got this uh, company, CRC company, which is a community interest company, non-profitable. And basically, I want to uh, encourage diversity in gardening. You know, attract younger people, attract people from all backgrounds. Would you be interested in being a director? And I thought about it for Nana's second, and I went, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, what a, let's do it, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And, and that's where we're at the moment. So we've moved on a few steps since then. We've done one garden, which was a college garden, Morley College Garden in yeah. the borough. And that's a community garden, is it? That's, that's for people a, yeah, for... Yeah, community yeah, garden, yeah, yeah. a small community garden. It was a small budget, but we're in a very... We're getting stronger and stronger. Um, we've actually managed to bring in funds... <laughs> about 80 grand so far wow brilliant France, and, that's, and that's grants, promise, grants and that's promise grants and yeah lottery yeah. funds that kind of thing wow with a promise of more so there's a lot of uh, good things happening and uh, we've got tv interest as well because Excellent. um there's a production company who are interested in charting our progress but really it's all about tasian i'm just there as his mentor right the guy's only 23 24 actually when well, he won't mind me saying this but he's 24 going on 44 <laughs> he's a wise he's man isn't he? very, yeah. he's wise beyond his years and really he doesn't need much mentoring i'm just yeah. there in the background but it's good for him to have, have, have you there isn't it it's because it, that yeah. kind of support is important in, yeah. that, in that environment like you say he's a young it lad is. so it's good for him isn't it, it is good for him and you know i'm old enough to be his granddad <laughs> <laughs> but I don't feel there's an age difference. And uh, and uh, so, the, if people want to find out more about this, there's a website. Is there? Grow to know website. Grow to know. So they can get on that. So and have they a look at what you're up to. Yeah, and yeah. if they want to donate, they're quite um, welcome to. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, but but the plan is to get as much as we can, so we can make a big difference to the community through engagement. You know, whether it's going into schools or people live in the yeah. borough, we can attract them and get them involved. Get their hands yeah. in the soil and I did, get I, them I, involved I, and, you know, and, and, and show them the wonders of yeah. horticulture. I think there's nothing uh, more of a social adhesive than, than getting out oh. in the garden. You can meet the poshest man in the world or any, you know, and you still get on with them if you're in a garden situation. Do you know, it's like what we're doing now. <laughs> yeah. What we're doing is smiling. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's only thing. It's one of the few things that makes me smile yeah. is, is talking about gardens. Yeah. You know, it's just something about it. And we're in this fantastic environment. I mean, as soon as I came off that road, I walked in. There was like this muddy, wide path that I was walking on. It was like, oh, yeah, relax. Geez. I was uh, the other day. I was walking. I, I was walking on the road. And I, I was <coughs> irritated by something. It would have been politics, probably. That's the only yeah, thing. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. And I and I cut through a woodland like you just described. This was over in a Palmer's Green, a mm. park there. And by the time I come out the other side of it, I'd forgotten what I was annoyed yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. It just has that effect on it you. Just doesn't have it? that yeah. calm and effect. It's good for the mind. And it's good for the soul. That leads me on to my next thing, because I know you just, you're going to do a garden in, the NA, in an NHS hospital, aren't you? Yeah, in Gloucestershire. Gloucester is a, Royal. Is a, right. yeah, so tell me a little bit about so that. So it's, it's early days at the moment. Okay. But they've agreed to pay me a consultation fee. Uh -huh. And I think it's going to happen. Sounds good. So really, it's about a, a space 
for the patients, well, for the doctors, nurses and patients, a place where they can recuperate to get some solace. Yeah. So really it's a, a way of saying thank you to the people. Who, Brilliant. Um, you know, and will you there. consult with them in terms of what what they um, what, what they, they like? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we don't. Really, um, I went there last week and I spoke to a, a couple of the bosses there, shall we say? And um, they've given me an outline of what they want, and, yeah. and they showed me around the. What area. kind of ideas are they thinking? Do you know, have you got? Uh, they a, haven't can, got can any you, ideas. I've got. I've got I've you've got, got the ideas. I've got, yeah. I've I've got, got, got the ideas. Away I'm secrets, not going to give away any secrets on the phone. Yeah, 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 no, that's good. That's all right. If I told you, Chris, I'd have to shoot you. Yeah, mate. okay, mate. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> well, that's yeah. a really positive thing then, because again, it's about that ethos of coming back, communities and people. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ethos, communities of people. And, and it's great. It's, it's nice to be in a position where I can give something, mm. give something back to the community sure. and, and leave my mark for yeah, many, many yeah. years. Yeah, I was going to say then, really, what I would say was probably the opposite of community is working in TV because it's kind of a different game completely, isn't it? Yeah, how, do you, yeah. how do you find that, especially sort of the make of stuff because it can be quite full on, can't oh, it? Oh, it's very fun. I don't people appreciate how hard work it is. How much oh, hard work. Yeah. I mean, I was, it was Grand Force that really got me into gardening. Right. I used to love it. Alan Tish Marsh and um, Tommy Walsh and Charlie Dimmock. And I, I'd just come out of a relationship many years ago and um, I was living in the bed sit and I had this little portable TV at the end of my bed and I couldn't wait for Sunday afternoons to come around for ground force. And I remember thinking to myself, what, what a great job to do. What, what a great thing to be doing. And little did I know that many years I'd be on TV <laughs> doing yeah, yeah. a similar thing. I mean, Instant Gardener wouldn't be around if it wasn't for ground force. Yeah, sure, they kind and of set the president. They set the presidents. I know people can be sniffy about, you know, makeovers and stuff. Uh. I, 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 it's not about that, is it? It's not about giving, like for instance, Instant Gardener is about giving somebody a garden a day. You're not. You're giving people a start. Yeah. You're giving them a bit of direction. A garden never finishes. It hasn't really got a start. Well, actually, or an the end. bit you do is the start of it, isn't it? Rather you, yeah, than finish. You, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. Do the, you do the start. You're kicking yeah. them off the off the squat off the yeah, starting yeah, blocks. You, you're empowering them. Yeah, yeah. Say right here it is. Now it's up to you to get on with it. Yeah, sure. Mm. I mean, they are heavy. I mean, I remember I did have quite a lot of makeovers mm. earlier in the day, and um, like, I used to have to lie in a dark room after three of them in a week because <laughs> 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 I mean, it is quite full on work. Oh, and well, it, and well, you're responsible for so many things. Yeah, aren't you? yeah. I mean, you're responsible. You design the thing. You design the garden. Yeah. I mean, in my case, I had to get the garden done in the day. Yeah. That was the thing. So that was pressure. And you've got to make a half hour TV. <laughs> and you've got to yeah. make, make uh, and it's all that stopping and starting and stuff, oh. as you know. And so that sort of eight hours you've got booked in to build the garden now becomes six hours. So it's a lot of pressure to get it done. You've then got your designs are there for all to see. So you're hoping that it'd be well take perceived yeah, cool. by the public. Sure. So that is the pressure. It's not just doing the garden and presenting. You've also got the nervous bit between then and when it's aired. Yeah, and, all, yeah. and whether the punter likes it, you got that in throwing oh, into yeah, the mix Oh, yeah, and whether well. they like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so you've got a lot of pressure going on. There's, you, there's lots of pressure, yeah. You did say also, yeah, and it's true, you know, you're the first black man to, uh, mm. to, to, to get on telly and do this kind yeah. of thing. When I started out as a gardener many moons <coughs> ago um, in the 80s, it was all white working class lands. There was, you, yeah. any, if there's any difference at all, there's not mm. even any women in it. And it's mm. changed a great deal. Yeah, it has. Do you, how do you promote diversity in horticulture? Because I know you're involved in that. Yeah, but I mean, really promoting it's just by being there. By right. being there and people seeing you. Do you think the it. telly helps with that? Telly will definitely help with yeah. doing that. They want, they, we need to see more people like me on the screen. Yeah. And then people can think, well, that relates to me. I can do that. One of the things that I find um, a bit weird is that I'm in the National Trust, I'm in the RHS, yeah. and I go and visit these places. And quite often, I'll be the only guy there. I'll be the only guy there, you know. I walk around all what? day, and I'm the only guy that looks like me yeah. that's um, frequenting that place. And what is it that's keeping these people away? Well, that's the yeah. big, that's a million dollar question, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, but I think TV has a lot to play in it because people watch these programs. I mean, I saw a program about Sissinghurst Gardens, and who was narrating it? One of the poshest voices, <laughs> yeah. you know, around Penelope Keith. Mm. You know, why can't they have like guy like you or no. guy like me doing yeah. it? You know, so people can relate to it and think, well, if he's there doing that, I'm going to go out and, you know, and enjoy that space as well. So it's how we're perceived a little bit. I've always mm. thought this about horticulture. For the media, there is that kind of, it is a little so, bit elitist, isn't it? It comes approach. across elitist, but personally. So how do we get down to like, that's what I suppose in a way you work in the community is important because it, it's mm. about making it contactable, do making it, from it real. The ground. We've got yeah. to do it from the ground upwards, mm. I think, and mm. that's the thing for, for me is to get people at an early age, get it young and trendy. If we can make it young and trendy instead of 
and that image of it being a sport, if you like, yeah. that comes to people later in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it, it needn't do that. It can come to people much earlier. It came to me later in life, to be honest. Although I enjoyed working in my own gardens and all yeah. the rest of it, as a professional, it came to me later Yeah, so in it's life. never too late to start, It's it, never Danny? too late yeah. to start, but we'd like to see more people, yeah. and we want it to be more varied, yeah. you know, rather than it perceived as being a certain type of person. Yes, certainly. I mean, it's... Uh, it's all wrong. Yeah. It's all wrong on so many levels. So <laughs> yeah. we're, and we're going to change it. And we're going to change it. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> a positive message. So I'm gonna, that brings me to you as a person in terms of your gardening. You know, your mm. uh, what, what, what really does it for you? I, I love it. I'm like a big tree and shrub man. I like. Is there a certain I love lots of, of trees. I love yeah. lots of trees in the garden. And there's no spaces too small for a tree, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. You can put a tree in any space. Mm. People are frightened of them. That's mm. the thing. Because mm. they think, oh, they grow big, out of control, and how are they going to handle them? But, you know, you shouldn't worry about that. Yeah. You know, because trees, like plants, you play God. You decide yeah. how big they grow. Yeah, so you've, you've got to look, look what species they're going to be. Plus, yeah. you're right, you can uh, you can uh, contain the roots. Obviously, you've got yeah, the way to a bonsai t- size if you want. You can contain yeah. roots. Yeah. You, can grow, you can grow a tree in a pot, can't yeah. you? you can grow, there's a tree for everything. I mean, there's um, aces, for example. They don't need a lot of room. Yeah. You know, you can put loads of aces in your garden and, keep, and, you know, and, and not worry too much about them. You know, but obviously you won't put um, a London plane or an oak in your <laughs> yeah, garden. Don't put that in your back garden. Right, if you've got, if, right if you've got about three acres, and yeah. then you're fine, you get away with yeah. it and you plant it well away from your house. Big fondness for trees then. And I think you, you're, not, you're big into wildlife as well. Is that kind yeah. of your thing as I well? Like, I like wildlife, yeah. I love wildlife. I love the connection. You got any wildlife. tips? Yeah. Would, you, would you put safer if you wanted wildlife in your garden? Lots of trees. Lots of trees. <laughs> trees yeah, trees yeah. and water. Yeah, yeah. Water attracts wildlife. And it doesn't have to be a big pond. Can even just be a little saucer of water. Yeah. You'll be sub- and you, you get the little there. birds in, won't you? Yeah, you, little you get saucer. little birds. Yeah. You get the hedgehog who might be passing yeah. through. Yeah. You get the old the, the dragonflies. You know the beetles. Yeah. They'll all come eventually. And do you think that um, we're becoming more organic in our approach to gardening in terms of like less per- pesticide use? And yeah, further? we are. Do you think that's we that's are, part of the role of it? We, are, we have to. We have to do that because well, you know one of the things I've noticed when I was a kid. I always saw hedgehogs. I can't remember the last time I saw. I, I tell you what, I've seen two in the last ten years, and they've both been dead ones. Really? Yeah, we, and we I got think that's with... down, And I think that's down to us. Yeah. Because we're using our stupid slug, slug pellets. pellets. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know, the irony is, in, if you introduce hedgehogs into your garden, they eat copious amounts of slugs. <laughs> yeah. So you don't need to have a yeah, slug yeah, pellet. Yeah, yeah. You know, you shouldn't have one anywhere near your property. Because the hedgehogs will look after you. And, and if, if um, a plant is munched by a slug, don't grow that plant. <laughs> grow something else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a wide variety of stuff out there yeah, sure. that you can put in your garden. Yeah. You know, so you've got to work with it. You've got you to work, work with it. Work, work with nature. Work with the environment, not against it. Ah, good, that's mm. a good, good way mm. to look at it, yeah. So what's what's next for, for Danny Clark then? What, what have you got up to in the future? What, um, well, I've, got, I've got a couple of things, but I can't say. Can't you? But you saw yeah. the stuff in the pipeline, basically. I've got stuff in the pipeline, yeah. I've just done a bit of filming. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited about it, and I feel very honoured for a, a, a certain gardening series. <laughs> 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 and I can't say anything at the moment. No, that's I can't, okay. I, can't, I can say it in private, but yeah. I can't put it out there because they want to make the big announcement. Yeah, sure. Um, no, it's I actually understand. been delayed at the moment because uh, one of the presenters has had a, an injury. Oh, right, okay. Right. So, so a garden we, I, injury. I, well, he was in his garden. <laughs> was he? And, and he fell over. I shouldn't be laughing. I <laughs> no, no, no. Everyone, it's funny, when I mention it uh. to people, and I tell them who it is, they do laugh. It's weird. Uh. I suppose I laughed as well when I heard about it, because I, I just can't imagine this guy doing it. So that's, your, that's our only hint, then. If you hear about an injured gardener, we'll get it. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, that's quite good for our listeners. Listen, the plot thickens, right? Yeah, You'll plot, find out in the, the future. The plot yeah. thickens, Have you been affected by COVID much? Has that done much? Yeah, 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 obviously. But um, do you know what? I think for gardeners, it's worked in our favour, because a lot of people have had to stay indoors yeah. because of what's been happening. They've been in their gardens, and they're seeing them in a different light now. They're it's not seeing them necessarily as space to throw out the kids to play or to turn a dog out or to put the washing out. They're actually seeing it as a space, See, I as think, an extension of their property. So, so in a way, I think we, 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 we're, we're in a, we've got in a driving seat a little bit because mm. people are suddenly gardening that weren't doing it before. And also we need to encourage people who have started gardening, we need to encourage them to carry on with it. Because the tendency is for people... They drift we're, off. Yeah, we're creatures of habit, and we'll, it'll be like, in a couple of years' time, it'll be like they're not doing it anymore. 
and we don't really want that. We want this to become a real sort of force. Well, I think that's a good jumping off point, that <laughs> statement, mate. I mean, right. that's a good way to finish in this beautiful surroundings in Hollywood. Yeah, I thought I'd bring you. I thought yeah, you'd no, no, that's, this. A, that's a good call, my friend. <laughs> yeah, it was right. worth coming in for. I, I was just hoping the weather was going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, I thought, if it was well, blowing. I looked at it the rain, I was like, oh, I don't know, but this, what a perfect day. It's a perfect, yeah. perfect yeah. day. Thank you, Danny. Yeah. I appreciate it. All right, cheers, mate. Thank yeah, you. yeah, you're most welcome. It's time to open the post bag, and I'm joined by Chris, Anton, and Hannah. Welcome, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hannah, would you like to start? What's our first question? Yeah, so we've got a question in from someone who's new to gardening, um, and they want to grow in raised beds, and they're asking where they can get organic topsoil from and what they should be looking out for. Anton, is that one you can help us with? Yes, this is a really common question. I suppose the most important thing to bear in mind is that you do need to use topsoil. Don't just fill up your raised beds with compost. For a start, that would be incredibly expensive getting sort of bags of compost. So really, a lot of companies will deliver topsoil in a tonne bag and that's the most economical way to do it and then there's a number of things you want to look for there is actually believe it or not a British standard for topsoil very catchily called BS3882 colon 2015 don't worry we'll put that on our website so you don't need to remember it so you need to look for that because that means that the soil will have been tested they have looked for contaminants they will check that it's not too acidic they'll check that it's not got a sort of high salt content which will stop your plants growing and that's what you want to look for to be honest most topsoil will have gone through that standard and then the other thing is quite often you see topsoil which has been specifically designed for veg growing and that's that's pretty handy because it means that you don't need to add anything else to it usually they've added some green waste compost and for that, there's, an, I'm afraid, another sort of standard you want to look for. It's called PASS 100. Again, that will be on our website. And, and that means that the compost has been composted to a certain standard and hasn't got contaminants in it. Believe it or not, there's not actually an organic standard for topsoil. It's not, there's no sort of certification scheme for it, but often it's listed as sort of suitable for organic growing. So you might want to look out for that. Anton, I think that's a very good point that you make about the organic use of the word organic, because I was hunting, funnily enough, for topsoil. And I came across so many people advertising organic and I got overexcited. And then, of course, I realized that they were using the word organic in terms of it's got living matter in it, not that it's certified for organic use. And there is a distinction there. And I think it's virtually impossible to find anything that is certified for organic use. And that's true because, it, I mean, organic growing means growing in the soil that's there on site. So it, it can't actually be certified. But that doesn't mean in a gardening situation you can't bring in topsoil if that's what you need to do. I think another thing to look at, which is quite interesting, is if you're creating some raised beds, what is the ground on which you're creating them? So... If, for instance, it's on grass and you want to convert some of your lawn into growing veg, if you put all this topsoil mixed with bulky compost and whatever on top of that grass, there's no need to actually dig up the grass or take the turf off because as long as you've got a thick enough layer, which is at least 15 to 20 centimetres deep, at least then the grass itself will rot down and actually provide nutrients. It will release the nitrogen from when it rots down. So don't worry about digging up before you add that big, thick layer of topsoil. Wouldn't you agree, Chris? Yes, I would. Yeah, that's exactly right, because the grass will rot down and all those lovely nutrients don't go to waste. I think the other thing pointed out as well is I have built quite a lot of raised beds in my time and I would never actually go and buy bagged compost, to be fair. I would always order it what I call a tum bag. So you order it on a bigger scale and that will save you a lot of money. And I was just wanted to, uh, going to ask Anton, there's a place near me that's got this huge pile of topsoil. It's a joy to behold, I tell you. And, uh, but I wonder where that's come from. Is it, is it from new builds or quarries? What is that likely to be organic? It's most likely to have come from a quarry. And usually most land that have excavated from quarries, it, it's come from grassland, which hasn't had any sort of chemicals put on it. So you're fairly safe for using that soil. And again, the British standard will test that topsoil to make sure it doesn't have contaminants in it. Okay. And what was the standard again, Anton? It's BS3882 colon 2015 that was the year that the latest standard came into place that's very well remembered mate that really is 
<laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the next question, someone's noticed some bright orange spots on their apple trees. Is it OK? Should they cut it out? Should they be concerned? Chris, what do you think they've got? Well, actually, this is a thing called coral spot. And it's very bright. You get these sort of dots all along the branch, bright orange. All that means is that branch is dead, really. It's a saprophyte, which means it, it will go on to stuff that's already dead and decay it down. So it's a good thing for a gardener in many ways. But it's also a good thing if you're pruning apples because it will tell you, it'll identify the damaged or dead material. So we'll go back to our golden rule of DDD, remove any dead disease or dying material. So it's telling you that that bit of wood is dead and to prune it out. But don't worry because it won't attack live material. So if I'm going to prune my apples at the end of this month, which is we're coming up to that time to spur for it, prune my apples, where I cut back all last year's growth, last season's growth to spurs to a couple of buds, I will also then be looking to DDD the tree. So if I see anything with coral spot on it, these orange spots, I know to remove that material. So is it is it quite obvious the difference between this coral spot and rust? Yeah, very much so. But it's a good question because obviously you get different types of fungus uh, on trees. And, uh, the rust tends to be on leaves. So there's a difference straight away and not wood. And also the coral spot's very, very um, easy to identify. It really is bright orange, sort of little small globules on the wood, whereas rust tends to be much darker in colour. But the important thing to remember, isn't it, Chris, that the whole tree isn't dying. It's just yeah. probably a specific branch or spur that's got well, it. The, the, it's good to point it out because it's just an indicator that you need to prune that, that piece of wood out, basically. So it's giving you a clue, if you like, by its saprophytic nature, by the fact it's breaking down that wood. It's giving you a clue to prune that area out. So not something to be horrified by. No, no need to uh, run screaming down the garden with that one. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. The next question is a green manure one. Um, so someone had some winter vetch growing on their veg patch as a green manure and when should they cut it down? Anton, what would you recommend? OK, well, vetch is a really nice thing to grow over winter. It's, it's really quite vigorous. It'll cover the ground well. It also fixes nitrogen, which is really, really useful. So it sort of benefits the soil in lots of ways. The thing with vetch is to just look out for the texture of the stems and the leaves. You want to be incorporating it or digging it in when it's still nice and lush and green, so it will be releasing its nutrients. When it flowers, it starts to get quite woody and then it will be lower in nutrient content and it will take much longer to break down. So just keep an eye on it, really. I can't sort of say a calendar date to dig it in. It's really sort of using your judgment. But I would say you need to plan forward and think what your next growing. So if, if you've got um, sort of transplants or something like that, you can be put, sort of incorporating it about three or four weeks beforehand. You might want to leave a little bit longer, sort of four or five weeks, if you're going to be sowing stuff directly, because that when it decomposes, it does actually release a chemical which stops seeds germinating. So you do need to leave a sort of four or five week gap between sort of incorporating it and sowing seeds direct. And Anton, do you dig it over or do you just cut it down and leave it on top of the soil? OK, so a lot of people are getting into sort of no dig growing and some people say, well, you can't use green manures because you have to dig them in. Well, that, that's not actually true. There's other ways of dealing with it. But I certainly find if you just chop it up finely and leave it on the surface, it tends to dry out and form a sort of thick mat. So what I do is I would then cover it with some leaf mould or compost and that will stop it drying out and help it to break down. And then you've got that nice sort of lush layer of um, leaf material breaking down and releasing its nutrients. And you've left the roots of the vetch plant in the soil. Yeah, it, it is an annual. So, if, you know, once you've chopped it down, it's, it's not going to grow back. I think it's brilliant that, that somebody is, is really taking their green manure seriously because they're such an unsung hero of the organic patch. They really, these are plants that really capture nutrients down into the, their roots and therefore release them into the soil that you're growing into. I think that one point that Anton made is really important is I grew mustard a couple of years ago and making sure you time chopping it down right I let it get too big and too pithy and then it just kind of sat there on the top doing nothing for ages. So making sure you time it right for when you cut it is quite important. And if you don't have access to the compost or leaf mould to put a layer over the top, what would you recommend doing then? Well, I would likely dig it in, but you don't have to dig the whole soil over. You know, it will break down if it's got a thin layer of soil over it. 
the other i mean the other thing if it's got a bit tough is you could then chop it up and put it in your compost as well then you're sort of saving those nutrients and and for later by composting and then then putting the compost on your soil at a later date okay brilliant thank you so our last question today and someone didn't manage to get any seed potatoes this year and they've asked whether they can use their supermarket potatoes instead. Hannah, I'm glad you've asked this question because I'm doing exactly that. I'm, I'm experimenting. I've got pink fir apple potatoes and I've got some indeterminate white potato from a, a bag from the greengrocer. Nobody quite knew what variety it was. And they're both chitting at the moment in egg boxes. And I'm interested to see how they chit, how they form and whether I can grow from them. But I can sort of hear Anton on my shoulder with a slight tut tut. Is that right, Anton? Yeah, I mean, certainly sort of plant pathologists would frown on you slightly for for doing that. I would say it's the sort of thing you could do once in a while, especially perhaps with unusual circumstances with with a lockdown and it's more difficult to get out and find seed. Why, Um, Anton? What what can be the issues? um, So from a plant health point of view, it's not a good thing to do regularly. Perhaps I could say a little bit how potato seed is produced. They've been grown in a very controlled environment. Usually they've been grown from guaranteed very healthy material to start off with, which is very disease free. And they've been grown in a location which is well away from other potato crops because a lot of these potato diseases, particularly viruses, are spread by aphids. So that's why they often come from parts of Scotland. So those um, potato seeds, when you get them, they've got a certain guarantee that they will not have a certain level of diseases in them. They've even been tested to make sure that those disease levels are below a threshold. So the potatoes that I got from the greengrocers or the supermarket are not necessarily guaranteed to be disease free and if I keep growing from them then I'm going to introduce those diseases into the soil. Yeah unlike other seeds which are a sort of result of cross-pollination and the plants getting rejuvenated a potato seed is literally it's a vegetative reproduction you're you're taking away a part of the plant basically and passing it on to the next generation so if you sort of continue to use your own potato seeds it's a bit like photocopying something and then redoing the photocopy of the photocopy each time you can get away with it once but once you start continually re-photocopying something you end up with quite a blurry mess so in a way you, you'll end up with these plants which are getting more and more viruses more and more diseases and that's, that's, it's a bit sort of bad man really if you're doing it in an allotment with other people around you it's you're basically increasing the pool of potato diseases around in potatoes being grown around in the area that's a very good point sarah you might not be very popular with your neighbors <laughs> no but it's an experiment i've started so i'll continue and as anton said you know lockdown brings its own challenges doesn't it and this was just one way i thought i could get around it yeah, it'll be interesting to uh, see the results sarah i'm sure you'll get a good crop out of it like say anton's probably better just doing it for one season in these rather adverse times yeah i'd say say it as a sort of naughty (laughs) one-off don't get into the habit of it (laughs) (laughs) oh that's brilliant thank you all i think we we've covered everything there great thank you hannah thank you everybody thank you thank you speak to you next month bye sadly we've come to the end but if you want to know anything more about what we've discussed this month then you can find plenty of information on the garden organic website just go to gardenorganic.org.uk forward slash podcast and if you're in the mood for buying don't forget to check out theorganiccatalog.com next month i chat with mark lane presenter on gardener's world he's a thoughtful garden designer viewing what grows in the garden from all heights and angles Oh, and before we go, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who's listened and been in touch. You've all been great at liking, reviewing and subscribing. So thank you. We have had some five star reviews from around the world, but perhaps this one is my favourite. When I started listening to this podcast, I was only toying with the idea of going organic on my new allotment. Now I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I think that says it all. Bye, everyone. Our thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.